when we finished our lecture last time, and again, just to listen to this because you should have in your notes, we talked about President Lincoln's plan for the South. That's our first subtopic. But what I'm going to talk about before is some reminders. Remember when the firing of the Civil War stopped, the South looked very dismal. The South had collapsed totally economically and socially. Beautiful cities like Charleston, South Carolina, and Richmond, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, were all gutted and in ruins. And one man from Atlanta, after witnessing his hometown after the Civil War, was quoted as saying, hell has laid her egg, and right here it hatched. We told you about the Southern way of life, social institutions, economic life, and agriculture, and how each of those areas were affected negatively by the results of the Civil War. And everything was a, just a hell of a mess, to be honest with you. And the man that's going to be responsible to fix all of this in the South following the Civil War is going to be President Abraham Lincoln. And he did develop a plan for what we call Reconstruction of the South. And one of his biggest issues is how am I going to get these, these Southern citizens who seceded from the Union, how do I give them back their citizenship into the Union? And how do I bring these states that seceded from the Union back into the Union? Keeping in mind, and we mentioned this, that these radical Republicans are really keeping an eye on Lincoln to see what he's going to do because they are still very upset that the South seceded in the first place. So he's, they're going to pay attention to Lincoln to see what he does here. So let's start with Southern citizens. What's Lincoln going to do? What does a Southern citizen have to do to get back his or her citizenship into the Union after the Civil War? Well, what Lincoln did, and you heard it on the video, on the Josie Wales video, is he offered amnesty to Southern citizens, which, was, which is another, it's a fancy name for a full pardon. I'm going to pardon you for all the bad things you did, and I'm going to give you amnesty and let you come back into the Union. But these citizens had to do something in return to get this amnesty. Okay, and that's what I'll tell you in just a second. So concerning individual citizens that lived in the South, Lincoln is going to offer amnesty or a full pardon. But this is what you had to do as a citizen in order to get that. Two things. Number one. Remember they had the soldiers take an oath of allegiance? Well, the citizen had to do the same thing. If you were a southern citizen and you were to come back into the Union, you would be required to take an oath of allegiance to the Union. O-A-T-H. So you'd have to, southern citizens were required to take an oath of allegiance to the United States. So not only do soldiers have to do it, as terms of surrender, but if a citizen wanted back into the Union, they had to take an oath of allegiance. Second thing they had to do was simply promise that they would accept federal laws, laws that were made by the federal government or the United States of America. They had to agree to those laws, which included what that they didn't like all of a sudden? The abolishment of slavery. Very good. So in order to get in for a citizen, they were required to take an oath of allegiance to the Union, and they had to promise to accept all federal laws, including those that abolished slavery. Is that tough, not tough to do? Okay, Lincoln's trying to really make this easy because he wants to reunite the Union, preserve the Union, so he's not going to make this difficult. What about Southern citizens that were not given amnesty? There were some that were not. They were not given a full pardon by the president. What do you gain by becoming a, a citizen of the Union again? The right to vote. Very good. Okay. Well, there were some Southern citizens that Lincoln did not give amnesty to. If you resigned your position in the federal government and served in a position in the Confederate government, you were not allowed amnesty. In other words, if you were, if you would have been Secretary of State for Lincoln, and you quit that job to become Secretary of State, so to speak, for the Confederacy, then you did not get amnesty. So if you had, if you held a government position, if you had a job in the government, you 
United States government, and you left that and took a job in the Confederate government, you were not given amnesty. Does that make sense? The second way you couldn't get amnesty, if you were a Southern citizen who served as a high-ranking officer in the Confederate Army, which tells you that Robert E. Lee would not be given amnesty. Okay? So if you were, again, a high-ranking officer in the Confederate Army, you would not be offered amnesty or this pardon by President Lincoln. And the third one's kind of interesting. If you were a southern citizen of any kind who had mistreated prisoners of war during the Civil War, it was proven that you did that, you were not given amnesty. So anyone in the South, any southern citizen who was proved to have mistreated prisoners of war would not be given amnesty. So again, southern citizens who resigned their positions in the federal government to serve in the Confederate government, Southern citizens who served as high-ranking officers in the Confederate Army, and any Southern citizen who was proved that you mistreated prisoners of war would not be given amnesty. Those were the three types of people that were not going to give it. So that's how he handled citizens. The bigger question, and the one he took the most heat over, was how do you handle the readmission of states, of these Southern states that seceded? He made this pretty simple. Now you think about this. This is what a southern state had to do to get back into the Union. One thing. 10% of the citizens living in that state had to pledge their allegiance to the Union. Only 10% of the citizens in that southern state had to pledge their allegiance to the Union. Now, a lot of Republican leaders, and that's, that's Lincoln's party, right? A lot of Republican leaders thought, wow, really? Because if you let these guys in, these people in this easy, and they get back into the Union, these states, not only can they vote and have electoral votes, but they also can come back in and hold political office, be elected to political office after just seceding from the Union. So a lot of the Congress was not happy about this. The Democrats weren't happy to a point, but most Democrats were what? Southerners. They were going to be Southerners. So he gets a lot of heat within his own party. So do not think this is quite right. They oppose the idea because if you pardon former Confederates that easily, they can come back into the United States and vote and actually hold political office. Now, the Republicans who most opposed Lincoln's plan were called the Radical Republicans. Now, the problem was at this time in Congress, who controlled the Congress, Republicans or Democrats? Obviously, since most Democrats were Southerners, who controlled the Congress? Republicans. And the problem was the majority of the Republicans in Congress were deemed radical Republicans. So in essence, the radical wing of the Republican Party was the one that was really controlling Congress. And they were very much against Lincoln's plan. And the two most notable radical Republicans in Congress were Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts and Representative Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. Those two guys were considered the most radical of the radical Republicans. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts and Representative Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. They were the radical of the radical. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, Representative Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. Are they on there? No, no, no. Like Jimmy. Steve oh, Thaddeus. Oh. 
Well, anyway, now the interesting thing about both Sumner and Stevens is their biggest concern is about these new black Americans who are now going to be officially part of the United States. And they had some concerns about that. They wanted to make sure that these black Americans would have the legal equality and education because they felt if you don't make them equal and you don't educate them, how are they going to survive in this new environment of non-slavery, right? Because what have they done their whole lives? They've been slaves, most uneducated, most not feeling equal. And Stevens and Sumner thought, you know what? Our biggest concern is what are you going to do for these new black Americans who are now have to deal with freedom with no skills educationally or otherwise? It's like the story where someone spends 60 years in prison and gets out. They can't function in the real world because all they've done is lived in prison and lived by prison rules and regulations. And they get out of prison they can't adapt. They can't get a job. They just can't function. Well, their concern was, Stevens and Sumner's, what are we going to do with all these blacks that we just free? They're, they, they've got to do something. All they've done is being slaves. We've got to educate them. We've got to make them feel equal so they can, have, they can prepare themselves for the responsibilities of this freedom. Freedom seems like that would be easy to take responsibility for. Maybe not so much when you've been under this particular way of life forever. Okay? Now these guys also were a little bit hardcore because both these two guys wanted to punish the South for everything bad that they did to Negroes. Both these guys really wanted to punish the South for all the injustices and discrimination that they believed the South did to the Negro. Okay? They really did. They wanted to punish the South for all the injustices and discrimination that those poor black slaves had suffered under Southern rule. So they were a little bit revengeful, right? Well, what they did because they didn't like Lincoln's plan is they eventually passed the next subtopic, the Wade Davis Bill. So because these radical Republicans didn't like Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction and the way he was going to bring in Southern citizens and especially Southern states, Congress, which was controlled by the radical Republicans, passed something we know as the Wade Davis Bill. What do you think the Wade Davis bill did? Think about what we're talking about. What did it do? Come on now. Well, kind of. What? Not so much censure, but it made it tougher for them to get in. They thought Lincoln was too soft, okay? So the Wade Davis bill called for stronger measures for a southern state to be readmitted to the Union. They're not that concerned about the citizens, whatever. They're concerned about these states coming in and taking an active part in what? Government, that's right. After they just seceded. So the Wade Davis bill is gonna call for stronger measures for a southern state to be readmitted into the Union. They're gonna try to circumvent who? The president, yeah, no question, okay? Now, this is what the Wade Davis bill has stated three requirements for a southern state to come back in. What did Lincoln require? How many requirements? One, and pretty pretty easy, 10% of the entire state has to pledge their, pledge their allegiance. That's not a big percentage. Okay, so he had one requirement. The Wade Davis bill is going to have three. Now, they'll accept Lincoln's as one of the three. 10% of the citizens in each state have to pledge their allegiance to the Union. So they take that one. So they're going to accept that, but they're going to add a couple more. So they go ahead and take Lincoln, part of, you know, part of what he said. They'll tell, yeah, we'll take that, Mr. President. 10% of the people in the state sign a pledge of allegiance to the Union. That's one requirement. The second requirement stated that if you came back in as a state, if you were going to hold political office, you had to have remained loyal to the Union during the Civil War. So 
So the second part was a requirement that the ability to hold political office be given only to Southerners that had remained loyal to the Union. In other words, how would you do that? Right, you didn't work so in the Confederate government, like you didn't bear states? arms. What's that? Wouldn't that be like neutral states? Pretty much. Or if some way as a Southerner you didn't bear arms, you just stayed on your farm and said, I'm not what you wouldn't have done. Yeah. But that but that's what they said. So their idea is to not to make it easy, right? Okay? So a requirement that the ability to hold political office be given only to Southerners that had remained loyal to the Union. That cut down the percentage a little, right? The third one was that each southern state, prior to getting back into the Union, had to redo their state constitution and recognize what? The abolishment of slavery. Every single state, if they were going to come back into the Union from the South, had to redo their state constitution and put a, a, a amendment to that constitution that stated that Slavery was illegal. The abolishment of slavery. Imagine how that tough that had been for a southern state to put that into their constitution after they just lost how many thousands of men fighting for that, right? But that was the thing. So the way Davis bill said, okay, Mr. Lincoln, that's fine. 10% of the people living in that southern state sign a pledge to get in. Secondly, the only way you can become and hold any political office in the United States of America is if you were a Southerner who had remained loyal to the Union. Now, who is who is a Southerner that remained loyal to the Union that's now Lincoln's vice president? Uh, Andrew, Andrew Johnson. Johnson. That's okay. The name there you go. And the third part of that was every state that wanted to come in from the South had to amend their state constitution and put in that the abolishment of slavery, that slavery was illegal. But what happens when Congress sends a bill for passage? They vote on it in the House and the Senate. So in July of 1864, this Wade Davis bill passed both houses of Congress by a small majority. So in July of 1864, this Wade Davis bill passes in Congress by a small majority. Where does it go after a bill is passed through Congress? To the president for his acceptance or his veto. Now, if a president vetoes a bill, does that mean it necessarily didn't go through? No. No. But it tells that the president doesn't agree with it. Well, when this Wade Davis bill <coughs> comes across President Lincoln's desk for final approval, he vetoes it for two reasons. He gives two reasons for vetoing the Wade Davis bill. When did the war end? Year? 1865. So this passed. Oh, I got. I must have the wrong date here. I don't know why. I'll look that up. Yeah, I don't know why I got that. I'll fix it. Now. The reason he vetoed the Wade Davis bill, first of all, is what did he want these states to be able to come in? Easily or hard? Easily. And he vetoed because he thought these rigid provisions that were set up in the Wade Davis bill would prevent these southern states from coming in as easily as his plan. Right? He wanted them back in. He wanted to preserve the union. He wanted to reunite, right? So he believed its rigid provisions would make it more difficult for southern states to be readmitted into the Union. The second reason he did it was kind of interesting. He didn't think that each state should make an amendment to their state constitution recognizing the abolishment of slavery. He thought it was a bigger deal than that. Where did he think the amendment ought to be made? In the United States Constitution which would bind every single state in the Union. So he said, you know, it's not enough to have them put it in their state constitution. We need to put an amendment to the United States Constitution that abolishes slavery nationwide. So those are the two reasons why Lincoln 
vetoed the Wade Davis bill because he thought it was too rigid and it would be difficult for southern states to get back in and he wanted to preserve the union and he didn't believe that it should be put in the state constitutions, he believed it should be put in the United States Constitution to encompass every state. Well, unfortunately, he doesn't live long enough to figure it out, right? The debate would continue without him. That'll take us to our next subtopic, which is the planned kidnapping of President Lincoln. The planned kidnapping. So, as I mentioned, you don't really need to write it down. Whether or not Lincoln could have won acceptance for his plan for Reconstruction was never answered. Uh, unfortunately for Lincoln, he had many enemies after the Civil War, both from the North and the South. And according to historians, Lincoln might have been one of the most hated men in history at that time. One of the most hated men in history. Now he's ranked one out of all of our presidents, usually in polls, either him or George Washington. But at the time, historians state that he was probably the most hated man in American history. Well, two days after the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, Lincoln addressed a crowd outside the White House. Different in those days. He just would go out in the White House and talk to any people that would gather there. There's no secret service, no planned agenda. He just decided two days after the Confederate surrendered Appomattox that he would address the people that were gathered outside the White House. And one of the things that he stated in this, quote, speech outside the White House is he was going to support voting rights.